Yo, welcome Packer fans to the Packernet Film Room on behalf of Packernet.com, the Packernet Podcast, Pack Daddy, JJ Leahy, uh, everybody who helps make this thing possible. Super excited to hang with you today. Um, super excited to see quite a few of you already ready to rock. I love it. Let's go. Let's do some fun stuff. Travis and Matt, you know, I'm excited. Uh, is that a beer I heard cracking? No, buddy. Uh, it's, a, it's a bubbly water. I'm actually here in my school, so... Uh, you know, that, that would be frowned upon, <laughs> um, to say the least. So, um, Matt, I'm good. I'm good to go. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, just to kind of give you guys an idea of, of what's going to go down, we're going to watch a little bit of film at first, and I'll kind of show you some of the in intricacies and some of the base things that the Rams like to do. And then we'll go ahead and head to the whiteboard. I'll show you kind of how all that works. I'll take your questions. Um, but most importantly, I think, is, is we'll show you how the Packers can attack this um, from a logical standpoint. And understand, I'm a high school coach. You know, my knowledge is very limited. These guys are eons above me and everything that I know. But um, I'll do my very best for you guys. Uh, throw the questions in the chat. I'll be kind of mixing it up between all the different screens here. So I hope to get your questions as soon as I can. And uh, without further ado, yo, let's, uh, let's get cracking. Now, you'll have to excuse me. My technology base isn't always the greatest. But um, we're going to start out, like I said, with a little bit of film here, um, and we'll go ahead and just start rolling some C or some <clears throat> excuse me Rams film against the Seahawks. So the first thing we're going to see here, the Rams love 21, 12, 13 personnel, these heavy personnel sets where they can get some big boys on the line. You see a tight end here and a tight end here and another what we call a bridge tight end or a wing tight end here. So this is what I would consider 13 personnel. Whether or not this kid is actually a tight end and listed as a tight end on the roster doesn't really matter to me because we have to think of him as a tight end here. And when we think of him and him and him as tight ends, we have to understand that what this, the Rams are trying to do here is add gaps to the defense. Okay, so you usually only have six gaps when you have five offensive linemen, but now they have seven, eight, nine potential gaps. So obviously the Seahawks have to adjust and, and go with that. I chose a lot of the Seahawks games. You'll see some Buccaneers film in here, uh, maybe some Niners, I don't really remember. But I chose them because this is a very, very similar look to what Green Bay does against heavy personnel sets, where they'll have their three down linemen. Um, this fourth down lineman can be a stand-up or a down lineman, usually an outside backer type of body, and then a linebacker here just to set the edge. So Green Bay has very similar defensive thought process so I, I thought this might be a really, really good one for you. So we'll go ahead and, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll go ahead and just start learning how wide zone itself works. And that's really the basis of their offense. This whole Shanahan scheme and, um, you know, with the guys coming out of it, like Lafleur, who, who's done a great job and kind of a, a Shanahan bred type of guy. Um, McVeigh, you know, obviously Shanahan in, in San Fran. These guys are all really, really good on the same system and then all have their own little tweaks and, and different things to make it their own, different ways of doing things. So we're gonna watch Goff right here. Uh, I got a couple questions already. Um, Goff is in, uh, Wolford is out. Um, that's actually good because I don't have a ton of film on Wolford. So um, we'll go through a lot of Goff's stuff here. Um, what you're going to see here is Goff under center, and he's going to go ahead and hard count this very first play against Seattle just to see what they're going to do. And he identifies right away the defensive line is wanting to slant. So the D-line is wanting to slant this way, and that'll drag the linebackers here. They'll be able to fill these gaps, and that's a really, really tough thing for wide zone um, because the Rams love to run wide zone weak. So their original play call has this sucker going to their right, the defense is left. That's what their original play call says. But Goff knows that because he sees this D lineman sliding, this true nose sliding, he's probably got a slant on. So that means he's gonna go ahead and check this sucker and you'll watch him check it at the line. He'll check it with his center. His center will relay it to the guards, guards to tight ends, you know, kind of that standard communication train. And they're gonna go ahead and flip this sucker and run wide zone to the strong side or to the tight end side over here. So now they're running to offenses left and defenses right. And they're just gonna go ahead and, and base most of what they do off of wide zone. And wide zone simply says this, we're gonna try to hook this dude with a little bit of a step play side and then scoop him with the guard. We're gonna try to reach this, the nose with the center and we're gonna use this guard to get up on this path backside 
We're going to ask this tackle to go ahead and scoop. And then we're going to ask this tight end duo here to go ahead and take this edge defender and scrape up to a scraping linebacker. And then wide zone is really cool, and the Green Bay Packers use wide zone like all the time. But it's really cool because it doesn't have a designated spot to hit for this kid. The running back has a couple of different reads. You'll see his eyes poke right to the first down lineman play side outside the center. So in this case, this four tech who's covering up the tackle. And he can just read him wherever he goes. Okay? See him stretching out? That means he's going to try to cut this up in here. But you got a couple of fat dudes in the way, so this isn't going to work out very well for him. But that's kind of the principle of what wide zone is. Obviously, this play didn't work out very well for him because you had a tight end trying to block a DN. That doesn't always work very well. But that's what they're basing it off of, and that's what they're trying to do. And they have quite a few wrinkles in their run game based off of wide zone, and it also opens up some really nice reads for Goff, who, in my opinion, has the physical abilities to make every throw, but kind of panics in some decision-making stuff. And we'll talk about that when we get to the throw game aspect of it. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the next play here. Remember how I kind of mentioned briefly that the Rams have a lot of wrinkles in wide zone. They can make it look different, or they can um, at times try to load it or lead with a blocker, something like that. Um, my apologies, I'm missing out on the comments. Lucas from Switzerland. What's up, dude? Appreciate that. That's awesome, man. What time is it in Switzerland, dude? That's crazy. Um, Daryl says, how do you think Goss hand holds up below freezing air? <laughs> it's going to be a tough one. Um, We'll get to golf a little bit here when we go through some of their passing stuff after I show you how they like to run the ball, but that's a great question and honestly one I don't have an answer for. Mr. Blue Sky says, given the weather and Goss injury, do you think we're going to see the Rams focus on the run a little bit more? I think we have all things pointing to yes. Um, and that's going to be kind of the basis on why I started with the run, and it kind of almost plays into the Rams' hands a little bit, because in my opinion, they're a little bit better at running the ball than actually throwing. So the Rams do use a lot of motion, but they don't use it like Green Bay uses motion. Green Bay is so freaking smart when they use motion because they try to use motion and formations to get better blocking angles for their O-linemen. I haven't seen a ton of that out of LA, but I have seen a ton of what we call load motion where this dude will come across and actually become an extra blocker here play side. So the Rams are again gonna run wide zone. This time they're gonna go to their right, the defense is left, and they're gonna snap that sucker and use the motion guy as a plus one or an extra hat in the run game. And he's gonna try to fit right here in C gap. Okay, so just a little wrinkle for them. And they love to toss out of wide zone as well. So they can either reverse pivot with Goff and toss that sucker out there, or they can do that really long mesh handoff, okay? Um, tossing it gets the ball to the edge a little faster. If they think they can get the edge, they can go ahead and toss it. That long looping handoff actually kind of sets up play action just a little bit better, and I'll show you that in a minute. But again, wide zone we'll see here. Goes ahead, you get a, a bad crack block from that receiver, but this will come into play a little bit later. So you're on receiver way over here, number 17. His job is to come across the formation and crack block this linebacker on this particular play. Okay? And we'll show you why in play action that becomes a real bear to try to take care of. But he doesn't do a great job there. He doesn't level off. And again, you have a D end on a tight end, so he wins that battle. But that's kind of the basis, right? The whole premise that this offense is built around. So um, wide zone and a, a couple of their different little cues on it, I guess, are um, are the base of their their whole thought process. And then they have this nifty little play, and this is kind of bonkers. So I want you to watch the feet and the footwork of the two inside linebackers here, okay? On a lot of wide zone stuff, the second that they see their guard, who is their key, the second that they see them move one way, they are free to just go scream and fill gaps. Because back here in the secondary, you should have a safety drilling down or an outside backer folding in. You should have somebody else accounting for the cutback should that happen. So they're free to just scream. Okay, so the Rams run this nasty little concept here that puts these dudes in conflicts. So watch just their first couple of steps, okay? Their first one, two steps, because that's all it takes to get them out of position. When we see the offensive line move right, just like this right here, that key says you're free to run. Now these guys are a little bit more patient than most, but even the, just the settling of their feet right here puts them in a bad position because now it gives your tackle and your backside here much better angles to go ahead and block them in space. And that's all it takes is just a little bit of a false step from the running back here, number 27, and just that action from the guards. And what this is is essentially a counter for wide zone. 
where these dudes are all going to run wide zone, you'll get split action lead across here, and they'll go ahead and run it to the backside of wide zone. See how 79, he doesn't have to fully cover up that linebacker, but just get in his way so he can't redirect this play. As soon as that thing happens, man, it all widens out. So they've got a, a couple of really nice little uh, base concepts like wide zone and then a couple of counters off of them that make it really difficult for those inside backers to really do their jobs based on their keys. Um, one of the things I've noticed in the Rams offense after studying them for quite a while is the whole basis of what they're trying to do comes down to can we get those inside linebackers in conflict? Can we trick them? Can we get them to read their keys incorrectly? Can we get them to false step or do a little bit of just slow play action? If we can slow those linebackers down, we can have a pretty good day offensively. And that's exactly what they've done here. And then it becomes even more apparent in the play action game. So I promise I'll get to the comments in just a moment. I just wanted to show you some of their play action game here really quick. So now on the play action stuff, we're gonna actually use the all 22 view as opposed to the, the wide view or the, uh, the end zone view so that we can actually get a good idea of what the route combos are because the receivers are actually all on the screen. So here, the Rams are just gonna run wide zone to their left. So the whole O-line is gonna dump off to the left. You're gonna get that same split action. So on the initial snap, it all looks like wide zone, okay? These running or these linebackers, especially this dude right here, are in conflict. So as that happens, you'll also notice the receivers run in a flood route. So 10 here, Cup, is gonna take the under, you're gonna get a corner from this dude, and you're gonna hit the flats right here. And what this does for Goff especially is really makes his keys or his progressions super, super simple. Okay, when he gets this, he's literally only got three things to look at and it can happen really quick. We teach our guys on any of our flood stuff to go touchdown to check down. Okay, that's how he reads this. That's how he's supposed to read it. So this would be his first read. Is that open? No. His second read, is that open? Then his third read, that open. Okay, if he gets to number three and it's not open, he's allowed to just tuck that ball and go. So we'll watch this play develop here, a very common, a staple play from the Rams. And you'll notice this linebacker bailing out underneath that intermediate route from Cooper Cup while the corner staying on top of the post. And they've done a nice job right here of leveling out that flats. So flood, one, two, three, we don't like any of it. Now Goff has the ability to just tuck this and get some positive yards. And he's gonna go pick up with the slide, he'll pick up like four, which is actually, it doesn't sound like much, but it keeps you ahead of the chains. And that's all the Rams are looking to do is just stay ahead of the chains. Get into a second and six or a sur survivable down in distance where they can still run the football. So that's why wide zone sets all of that up. That's really what they're looking to do is get some of these inside backers slipping, maybe get a corner who's supposed to come up and set the edge, maybe get him slipping, something like that. They're looking to put that defense in conflict with play action. And I promise I'm gonna get to the comments here real quick, so I'll go ahead and take a look at those before we go to the next couple of plays, okay? Uh, Garrett, um, oh, I'm sorry, I missed a couple here. Daryl says, since they'll run more, do you think our middle linebackers have to be the most dominant on defense? So, and <clears throat> excuse me, more than the D-line or our outside backers. Yeah, your middle backers are gonna make and break this game defensively for you without a doubt. Um, just keying on the simple fact that the Rams, all they wanna do is put those dudes in conflict so they can pick on them. They're not asking Goff all the time to air that sucker out and get into scramble drill. I mean, he's not Aaron Rodgers, right? This offense looks completely different than Green Bay's. If anything, this looks a lot more like the Bears offense, just a little bit more advanced. So they're looking to get those middle backers in conflict. They're looking to flatten out that line of scrimmage and let that running back go do stuff in space. Garrett says, what running back the Packers have faced this season best compares to Akers? Uh, and how did the defense fare against that running back? Again, I go back to Chicago. This is a very Chicago-esque um, type of setup. So you guys have this little nickel back that I am just um, over the moon about. Number 39, this kid is, I, I've said it before, this kid is just nasty. He's a little bit of a liability in the um, the drop back passing game, so, so out of some empty stuff. You know, he doesn't flip his hips super well. He's not a dominant cover dude, but I, my guess is more often than not, when they're running some of this play action stuff, they're gonna set him away from the tight end because that dude, when that tight end comes across the formation and any sort of like layup type of looks, um, that dude is just gonna smother him. I was so impressed watching him against Chicago. Number 39 is a dog. He's not a big dude, but he plays like he's 6'5", 235. I mean, he's, he's a dog. 
So having a guy like that on your roster can certainly help out that play action game. Um, Daryl says, Garrett, the first running back that comes to mind is Montgomery from Chicago. Daryl, I mean, you're right on this similar wavelength, man. I appreciate that. Um, a couple of checks that the Rams do, and this is kind of getting into like that intermediate level of football knowledge, but a couple of the checks that they do to just try to manipulate the box is one of them is an empty check, okay? So they'll start out in like 10 or 11 personnel with no tight end on the field or maybe even have a tight end on the field, but keeping that running back back here in the backfield, okay? And if they keep that running back in the backfield, the defense has a certain call on. You know, you've got your defensive call. However, most defenses in the NFL, when you see empty, you go to a completely different call. So when that dude motions out right here and there's no running back, which means there's not really a running threat anymore unless you're playing the Ravens, um, as soon as that dude gets out of that backfield, you usually snap to a different call, a smoke blitz or a plus one or something like that, cover zero wise, because now you have five eligible receivers outside the tackle box and you can kill the run. What the Rams like to do, because I, I have a, a, a feeling it's because they don't always trust uh, Goff's ability to get that ball out as quick as they need to, is they like to get to empty and snap it quick. They like to go to empty as fast as the rules will allow them. So the rules state, if you do put a man in motion, which they're doing here by getting 34 out of the backfield, he has to get set if he's going to be on the line or if, he's, if you have two dudes in motion, which they had previous, if we back this thing up, we'll go ahead and see a couple of dudes in motion at the same time. This guy coming across the formation, then Akers getting set. They need to get set for one second. They have to be set for a full second to allow the defense to adjust, and then you can go. So once he gets set right here, 34, they're going to count 1-1,000, one, 1, and then they're going to go ahead and snap that. Okay? What the Packers have to make sure they're doing is double calling every play because the Rams really like to get to empty or come from empty and get into a heavy set. So you have to make sure you're defensively double calling every play. If it's empty, here's our call. If it's not empty, here's our call. And then let that middle linebacker, whoever's calling your defense, make the call from there. Because when you go really quick like this, usually the only thing you can do is play coverage wise is play man cover one. So you can see here 37, he's the cover one safety and everybody else is locked in man coverage. And when you have man coverage, out routes are layups because they're giving them to you based on leverage. So you can see Cooper Cup here just runs a simple out. Jared Goff definitely has the arm to get that ball there. He's got the physical ability to get that ball there. Okay, and they're simplifying his reads for a first down. It's literally, we're going to give you this layup. We're going to give you this out route because we formationed you into empty quickly. We knew they were going to check into man. So we're just going to give this one to you. Okay. And then the inverse of that, and I'll get to the, um, who's that? Oh, Travis says, love Ch Chardon Sullivan. Um, Sullivan, yeah, that's that 39 kid. That dude is a beast. Like, yo, <laughs> I mean, if you can get him to actually cover pretty decently well in any of your drop read or drop gator stuff, um, pay that man because he's going to make you some money. Um, anyways, I digress. Right here we have the Rams in that heavy set that we talked about, but they're in empty. So really what they're doing here early in the game against Tampa Bay is they're just trying to figure out what Tampa Bay's empty check is, right? So when you've got that, you can go ahead and figure out how they're going to treat empty. Okay, we see they're going to play man in it. Sweet. We can go ahead and motion that running back back in and get back into our original call. Now by doing that, you've given your offensive coordinator up in the booth the ability to scheme later on in the game against how they're going to play empty. So you're just it's what we call an identifier. And then off of this, you're going to see that long fake boot action here. So it's a long fake boot right there, big mesh look. And you've got this dude coming across the formation here. Now, because they knew that they had man coverage, because they were able to identify man coverage, this poor dude's man defender is going to have to run through all of that trash and pick him up late. Here's 24 on the run fit right here. He's got to respect the run fit. Because of that, they've got him in conflict, and you can go ahead and hit the flats with this tight end. It's a layup throw for Goff. You're stealing some yards. It's super easy. It's just a flood pattern again. Okay? I expect fully to see that number 39 Sullivan kid um, in the mix on that play. Okay? Um, and then here's just one little nasty wrinkle. I had to throw it in because this, <laughs> this is almost mean. This is like that deep level, like, like football 301 type of 
setup. This is nasty from the Rams. You can see they start in empty, but then they start motioning this running back back in. So remember, we start in empty. We see what the defense's check is. Here we can see, oh, okay, they're actually going to play some zone against it. That's what this looks like. So then you motion that running back back in, make them change their call because now they have the ability to run the football once that once this dude comes back in, they have the chance to run the football. So you got to switch your call and then watch what they do with him. This is so mean. They take him back and then they set him up there as a sniffer, we call it, or right off of the guard. Now, there's no way in heck they're going to be able to run the ball from his alignment, right? That's never going to happen. So what they do is they max protect this kid, knowing that they're probably going to get an empty check or some sort of um, empty blitz look. And then they just put him in as a sixth offensive lineman, and he picks up the twist stunt. That is dirty. That's just nasty. And also what that's done is when he came back into the game, it made 45 bail out. Now, 45 has got to go take what we call the low hole, or this area right here as these safeties bail, okay? But because 45 was on the line of scrimmage, now having to bail out and reroute, you're gonna watch this low hole way open up. This little dig route to Cooper Cup, the whole theory of this offense is just run the ball, run the ball, hit some play action, pretty soon it's gonna open up that hole through the middle of the field. That sucker is wide open, easy read for Goff, a pitch and catch, and then you're getting your special athlete the ball in space. So it's a really well-designed setup. I truly believe that the Rams' offense isn't as bad as many people say it is. I think they're a playmaker or two away from being really, really scary again. So these are just some things I picked up just in film, kind of scheme-wise, of what they're really trying to do. And then um, after this, I'll show you on the whiteboard, and we can go ahead and uh, show how the Packers can stop it. So... Um, oh, Chandon. Thank you, Travis. It's Chandon Sullivan. Uh, JB says, go, Pat, go. Um, Levi says, go, Pat, go as well. So, I mean, there's there's some really, really cool stuff here that the Rams do. Um, appreciate you all joining us. Now, let's head to the whiteboard real quick. Um, hopefully, my audio doesn't get too bad. If my audio sucks, um, somebody please, like, let me know and just say, hey, dude, you, you're sucking. I can't hear you anymore, and I can go ahead and try to fix that with a headset and that sort of stuff. So I don't have any ability to tell. I can see the live stream with all of the, uh, all the different questions and stuff, but I can't really tell if my audio sucks. So let's start out, and they're kind of one of their more base formations for the Rams here in blue. So we'll put the Rams in blue, and then when we draw the Packers up, we'll put them in black. So some of the things they love to run out of let's just go under center at first with a single tail back here and then they like to go in a tray set or kind of overload so they declared a strong side and declared a weak side okay that means the defense has to adjust to this in some way shape or form what we've seen the packers do traditionally against this especially against the bears they give that big nose a true zero technique then you'll get a four eye and a four eye or just inside the tackle here that'll be the alignment of the defensive ends and then the outside linebackers are usually up on the line in a two-point stance. So you got three down linemen, two dudes here in your traditional two-point outside backer stance, but really condensed because we have a condensed formation. Then you usually have, depending on how they'll call the strength, the Sam and the Mike. So right now, as it stands, you've got a seven-man box, which is a pretty good look for Green Bay because they only, at the best, have seven blockers until you get to the outside M or that wing player. Okay, then of course, you're gonna have a corner. Let's just, for fun's sake, let's just put him in man. And then usually when you see what's called a nub tight end here, or a tight end on the line with no receivers out of him, you'll go ahead and stack a corner over there as well. Now we need to get a safety drilled down here into the box a little bit more. I call him the Hawk, so he's the H up here. Okay, and he's gonna be head up over there. And then you'll have your middle of the field safety or your free safety here. And this is a pretty base alignment for Green Bay. When we go all the way back to the run game, remember I told you the Rams love to try to run this week because what they're trying to do is get their tail back one-on-one -on -one with a cornerback. So the only dude they're going to try not to block here is that corner because traditionally corners are the worst tacklers on a football team. Okay, Not always, obviously. There's some really good tackling corners, but if you're a tailback who can't run through a cornerback, Usually you got to be a different tailback. Go find one off the bench or something. I don't know. Sign one from the practice squad. Make this dude run through this dude. So this is the guy that we're not going to block. Okay? Wide zone says we're going to try to hook him. Then we're going to both work to hook that four eye up to that Mike linebacker as he flows. 
We're going to try to hook the center or hook the nose with the center and then the same thing backside. Give a little shove to the fore eye so he can be taken over by the tackle and then try to scrape off this linebacker on his path. And then we can go ahead and hook up to the hog and hook up here. Quarterback will reverse pivot out. The tailback can then pick his gap here, here, here. If all of this gets closed up, he can bounce it to the outside and go take that corner one on one. This has to happen fast though. He's got to make his reads no, 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 yes, or no, yes, and get right up the field. Otherwise, these dudes will come into play, okay? So that's how they like to do wide zone. And then obviously out of this same formation, let me get rid of all my mess here, but out of that exact same formation, they have a really good play action set off of it. So if you remember wide zone, you have to remember that these linebackers have to go quick to beat the path of that block, right? So if those linebackers have to go really quick to, to break the path of the offensive line's block, that could put them in some conflict. They could be slow on the backside and susceptible to any sort of play action. So what the Rams love to do is go ahead and give this look. Excuse me here, let me use blue for the Rams. Okay, they'll just still step that whole offensive line this way, even at times load it with that, that tight end blocking that. And then they'll get that long action out of a reverse out, and then he'll just flip his hips and come this way. Now he's got a big combo, okay? Now he's got some sort of flood combo. A lot of times what you see is this H push off and then come out to a corner route. The M will go ahead and run a flag route, or a flat route, excuse me. The X will make it seem like he's gonna come and block the H and then pivot out here. And as Goff comes around, he can just look touchdown to check down. See if any of those are open. If none of those are open, he can just take the ball and go get four or five yards, whatever he can. Okay? Um, got a bunch of questions. I'm going to go try to catch up on these really quick, and I'll show you what the Packers can do. Um, Goose says, missed a bunch because I don't understand time zone, so is playing coverage heavy scheme a good answer against the Rams? We'll get to that. Um, some different coverages that Green Bay can do. Um, Travis says, uh, does breaking down NFL games help you in coaching high school? Does it ever inspire some plays for your team? Oh, hell yeah. Um, I, I, I traditionally don't like, like this is one of the, the first years in a long time that I got back into NFL, and it's because, you know, COVID took away our high school season this last season and stuff like that. So I had some free time. I reached out to, well, actually, Ryan reached out to me, and it's been just an amazing thing. I've been loving it. Um, this gives me a lot more answers. The problem is I'm dealing with, you know, 16- and 17-year-old kids who, while maybe they love football, also love music and also love girls and everything else that we all loved back in high school, right? So um, I got to be careful when looking at all this not to over-scheme those kids, you know what I mean? But um, watching the NFL really is, I mean, watching the intelligence level of these guys, even little tricks like motion and stuff like that, um, yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, Goose says, so they're going to try to run a kick. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm not a personnel guy. I don't, I don't pretend to know these guys as well as you do. But, yeah, they're going to probably try to run at your worst tackling corner more often than not. Uh, Daryl says, yeah, King will be picked on for sure. My guess is, though, he'll be picked on a little bit more in the passing game because it's really easy to just add a blocker and go load up on a corner. Okay, it's really, really hard to, to beat Ja one-on-one. -on -one. So my guess is he'll be picked on a little bit more. On this side, they'll try to formation away from him and get King over here to pick on him with some of these flat routes and that sort of stuff. So I'm going to erase my giant mess here. I'm just going to go back to what Green Bay, some of the answers Green Bay can have defensively. The first and easiest way to beat zone if you're looking at stopping the run is just what Seattle tried with the hard count that the Rams showed. The first and easiest way to mess this all up is to go ahead and slant or get some movement from your D linemen and make the backers make them right, okay? So if we have a four eye, this marker sucks, you're fired. Okay, we got a four eye there and a nose here and a four eye here, and then your Sam backer, your Mike backer, and your two outside backers, the outside backers must, must, must hold the edge. If they get stretched out or reached or anything like that, it's game over, okay? You're in a foot race. So they gotta slam down violently and hold the edge here and here, okay? Then what the Packers can do is slant to the side or away from the side, either way works, but they can slant these defensive linemen to where they think that ball's going. If they see a lot of weak side zone, you can go ahead and slant him right through. Now he holds that gap. 
Now he comes over and holds this gap. Now he can slam in and hold that gap. And then the linebackers can actually make them right. So he can slow play that a little bit more. If he sees the tailback cut in on his zone path, he thinks, oh, here's an open gap. I'm going to go here. Because this Mike is slow playing it, he can go ahead and fold right in and make that tackle right there. Okay? Same thing with the Sam. He can slow play it a little bit. He's guessing that that backside gap is going to be closed unless that tailback wants to cut it all the way back. So sweet. He can slow play it and fold over for help as well. Here's the ticket, though. Here's where slanting your D-line and allowing those linebackers to play a little bit more free really, really helps. When these guys get to slow play here and here, all of a sudden now they're in a great position to redirect in any sort of play action game. The second that they sniff out play action, they're in a much better stop, spot. Instead of playing down here, getting sucked all the way up in play action, now this Sam can come back over and reroute this dude on his flag route. Take the under so the safety can stay over the top. Okay? This Mike can be screaming here flat-wise for that type of look, and then actually go ahead and barrel into the X. You can hit dudes if they're five yards or less behind or inside the line of scrimmage, you can reroute, you can hit dudes, and that'll give them time to do that. So slanting the D-line will certainly help if you slant it, if you guess right and slant it to the run, it certainly helps in the run game, and it definitely helps in the play action game. Or you can slant it the wrong way on purpose. You can slant it strong, knowing that the Rams love to run this sucker weak. So if you want to do that, you certainly can still. It just takes the takes these guys, those inside backers, out of the play action game a little bit more, okay? So this is a little bit more gamble. It's a, it's a great, great risk reward type of setup. You slant these guys away and he holds here and he holds there and he holds there and they do their jobs right. Well, all of a sudden, this guy's job is to double this up to a scraping backer, right? And this guy's job is to wall out here. The, mics, or the center's job is to go here and try to wall off here, and you're supposed to go back here, try to wall off here. When you slant off away from them, they don't ever truly get off of that double then. They have to take a false step, and now they're a little slower to backers. So slanting away and letting these backers just fire gaps definitely kills the run game. That certainly kills that run game, but it leaves all of this wide open for any of your play action stuff that we saw um, Tampa Bay fall trap to. So there are definitely some options. You got to be a little bit careful on how you play it. And then my recommendation coverage wise, if you're seeing a lot of these condensed sets from the Rams would be cover three. And I'll show you how that works in just a moment. Let me check the comments. Holy smokes. This is awesome. Look at you guys go. Uh, <laughs> Goose says he loves girls. I'm not here to judge, man. You love whoever you want as long as it's legal. Uh, they're going to need outside backers to hold their edge strongly, most certainly. Like, if you don't have outside backers that can defeat the blocks of tight ends, you might as well not even show up to the game because they're going to run for 300 yards on you, okay? You need outside backers that are violent at the point of attack. Now, one upside thing, in Week 16, moving into Week 17 against Chicago, we broke down that Week 16 game. I forget who it was against even, but um, J.J. Leahy right here, follow him. He's really smart. He made a point that, like, hey – this outside backers coach for the Packers, I believe his name is Mike Smith, he's been working with Rashawn Gary one-on-one -on -one quite a bit, okay? Um, and then we start really taking a look at Rashawn Gary, and that dude is so violent now with his hands. Whole different player than you saw at the beginning of the year. Now all of a sudden, when he instead of assuming blocks and trying to peek off of them, he is here with it. I mean, he is just shock and shed, maintaining distance, keeping his outside arm free. It's a thing of beauty to watch, really, uh, uh, that Rashawn Gary kid in the run game. So that's at least a little bit of a... Um, exciting thing for you okay and we'll get into their jobs in, in the play action game in just a moment but great point on that outside backers must do their jobs um garrett says with the addition of snacks does his experience playing the rams twice this season help his chances of playing more my guess would be yeah um one of the things that snacks does out i gotta show you this because this is evil it's so funny though like he's just so smart and we'll just draw this up in my studies of snacks, when he is the nose, when he's aligned dead up nose to nose with the center, what he always likes to do is attack the snap hand of that center. He always just attacks the snap hand. So if you have a right-handed center, think about this, okay? This center's job sucks, especially in wide zone. He has to snap the football while simultaneously stepping to the play side. And as soon as he snaps that football, he's got to fire his hands back up and try to get into the breastplate of that nose. 
So what this dude is so good at, say we have a right-handed center, as he snaps that football, his hands are already there. So that center's arm and shoulder gets pinned down. And you don't have any strength if your arm is pinned down here. You can't curl that sucker back up. Not against snacks. That dude weighs like 900 pounds, right? So he just goes and attacks that shoulder right away and allows him to get excellent penetration here. Now that doesn't always mean he makes the play. He doesn't have to. He has to just get excellent penetration here. So as that tailback grabs that handoff or grabs that toss and sees that penetra penetration, that means this gap is closed. But it also means he can't go here or here because he can't run through snacks. So all that does now is tell him he has to cut that back. And if you cut that back, you've got a really, really angry dude that nobody blocked here. Usually this is that Amos kid who is angry. Okay, so he'll just fly down and absolutely cut him down, gain of one, gain of two. And if you're a running back, have to cut it back all the time because your center can't get a reach back block on wide zone, um, you're hurting. I mean, that, that sucks. Because think about it, you come through the mesh point with your arms up like this if you're running right, and then that ball is cradled in your right hand. Now you gotta cut it back. That ball is still cradled in your right hand, so you gotta go two hands on it, knowing that that ball is now exposed to the interior of the defender, because you're not gonna have time to switch it. So you gotta keep that thing tucked in the right hand until you get to space, which means you gotta get your left hand to brace that so you don't fumble, and now your rib cage is exposed. That sucks, okay? I don't do sit-ups, and even if you do do sit-ups, it don't matter, because this dude is angry and aiming right at your rib cage, and that hurts. That hurts really, really bad. So that's just one of those little things, like the tiniest little things, attacking the snap hand of the center, right? All of a sudden, that can make that tailback not want to play tailback anymore that game. It's amazing what they can do. So my apologies on the little rant there. I just think it's really, really awesome. It's a really good idea, and he's really good at it. For being a big dude, he's fast. So um, watch for that on the game on Saturday. Um, the middle linebackers definitely need to be smart and smash some heads for sure. I mean, you got to be violent at the point of attack, but you also have to have the ability to flip your hips and go. This Martin kid, this rookie you guys have, I remember watching him at uh, Minnesota because I'm a Big Ten fan. Um, this dude is violent downhill. He is just 100 miles an hour downhill. But obviously, that makes him a liability in any of the play action games. So you got to be careful on that a little bit. Dan uh, Laduino, Laudanudo. I'm sorry, Dan, I butchered your last name because I don't read too good. Okay. Um, Dan says, just tuned in. What did Seattle do wrong in allowing so many yards to their running backs? And can they force us to do it as well? Great question, Dan. Um, what we had seen on film a little bit earlier is Seattle actually fell victim to some of the counter plays that they have. So, um, uh, who are they? LA? Who are you guys playing? LA? Yeah, you're playing the Rams, damn it. Okay, so LA would come out with this and they would give the look of running wide zone to the left and then they'd have that tailback press and then cut it all the way back. Because those two backers here, they'd start flowing a little bit because they get their reads from their guards. They start flowing a little bit, right? And then they all of a sudden are wrong, but as they're wrong and coming back to backtrack to the ball, this tackle is already there. He's already on a great path to him. So they do some really, really nice stuff counter-wise. And also, um, to be honest, and I try my best not to get into the personnel type of stuff or the grading and saying this player is better than that player or whatever, um, simply because I don't know these dudes, I don't know the scheme super well, but I do actually think that most of your defensive line is just straight up better than Seattle's. Um, to call a spade a spade, um, aside from this, uh, that uh, 94 dude, who I'm not always a fan of at times, I think he's, um, well, it doesn't matter what I think of him, um, I think you guys are better than him. So I expect a little bit less in the run game as long as your inside backers are ready and, and definitely making the reads and, and just going very, very basic and your outside backers are violent. So great question, Dan, that's awesome. Um, Goose says, love your energy, totally got me excited for snacks out there, hope they pair him with Clark a lot, that's what I, that's what I expect to see. I don't know how many snaps dude will get, but um, my guess is he's going to be out there head up over nose or head up over center quite a bit. Um, Mary, welcome to the chat. Mary says, 
do you do this sort of stuff for any other teams right now or just the Packers? Just curious. Um, I do a little bit of it for the Ravens as well just because I freaking love the Ravens and their offense, man. It is so cool. I mean, they're running. I, I would hate to play inside backer against them, honestly. I played um, outside linebacker, and to be fair, I was absolutely terrible. I got cut from a semi-pro team three weeks after I started, so I was terrible. But um, they were uh, using a whole lot of stuff, like like zone runs type of stuff, like a lot of the stuff you see with the Rams. And then they'd come back with a full GT counter, and then they'd come back pulling guards, and Lamar would run the other way. I mean, it was just bonkers, right? So um, I should have mentioned this before, but I'm not a fan of any team. Like, I don't, I don't follow NFL enough. I, I win fantasy leagues, if that counts for anything. But I don't really follow the NFL much. I follow, like, really schematically cool football or what I think is cool football. So I love Coastal Carolina. I love Toledo. I love watching Miami of Ohio versus, you know, Northern Illinois because it's they don't have the athletes to just go out and physically dominate, so they have to be really good scheme-wise. So that's what I like seeing. Um, the one team I cheat on and allow myself to be a fan of is the Wisconsin Badgers because their O-line is just so nasty. But um, – I forgot where we were. Oh, we were going to go to coverage. Uh, my bad. So thank you for all the questions and comments. This is dope. I'm loving it. Keep firing them in if you have questions and comments, observations, things that I miss or mess up on or personnel that I screw up. Um, just throw it in the chat. Certainly appreciate that. I told you that I would like to see a little bit more cover three, and I'll show you how that works, okay, and why it could actually be really, really good against these sets. So cover three is kind of phasing out of the professional game right now a little bit. Um, football is very cyclical, so once a newfangled thing comes in, all the defenses try to stop that, then it's kind of good to go back to the old stuff because it works better against it, whatever, okay? Cover three is kind of nasty against these. Oh, geez, I should get my alignments right. Cover three is kind of nasty against these types of teams because it has the ability to protect these two inside backers just a little bit more, okay? Where it hurts is with the outside backers. So you have the ability to go ahead and spin a safety down and, and, and some of those things, okay? But a couple of different versions of cover three are called sky and cloud, okay? Sky and cloud cover three is really, really cool. So the way I would play it to this type of look is I would keep my free here and tell him on any sort of pass, you're responsible for this deep third. Anybody going in there, you got a man-to-man, -man, okay? Anybody who breaks the hips or the hip line of those two inside backers going in that third, he's yours. So if you've got this type of release from that tight end, he's yours, man to man. Okay, free, he's all yours. And then over here, if we play sky um, cover three, that means that the invert safety or this hawk dude, sometimes Amos, that I drew in here, he's going to go ahead and drop down and cover the flats. Sky means safety has flats. Safety. Okay? He has the flats. That means this corner is just responsible for this deep third. So what he can do then is look for anybody coming this way and take a man after that hard deck, right? Hawk is already coming down into the flats, so he should have that covered up. Now it kind of frees up that outside backer for that intermediate route, and that just gives him a little bit more time to read, okay, play action, redirect, and go. And there's all sorts of variances here. This is a very, very basic one because we didn't even put that cat into the count yet, okay? A lot of teams like to spin this whole coverage so they don't even have to worry about the outside backer, which means the corner can funnel with this when you see this big, long play action here, okay? The corner can funnel with this, push the safety over here, let this corner go ahead and rob this intermediate area, and you've still got the hawk down here for the flats. It's a little bit more of a cover too. It does open you up to some of this throwback stuff. Yeah, I get it. But um, that's just one of the adjustments they make. And then obviously cloud cover three is just the inverse jobs for the safety in the corner. Where instead of that safety, this guy H here, instead of him dropping down into the flats area, he would just bail off to that deep third and the corner can just go ahead and sit in a hard cover three right in that flats area. So there's just a bunch of different variations. I like cover three against condensed sets, especially if you can do what's called a read cover three, where instead of just going into your spot dropping into your zones, if you can actually read the routes of the, the receivers and go from there, um, usually that's a little bit better. It's a little more expensive to teach. It takes some time to teach that stuff up, but um, usually it just pattern matches a little bit better. So Kyle, hi Kyle, thanks for joining the chat. 
Just a thought, but I've never played football and don't know the X's and O's. Will you ever do a video on things like defensive package names and formations, route names, etc.? Oh, man, I'd love to. Love to. So one of the things that um, Ryan and I are kind of kicking around is making, like, different levels, I guess, of videos to where we can do kind of a football 101 type of setup. And then that intermediate level, you know, football 201 to where we've gotten out of the base stuff. Now we can start taking a look at um, different formations and how they hurt defenses or different defensive adjustments and how they can hurt offenses. And then eventually get into that football 301 type of setup where, yo, this is, now we can talk pattern match coverages. Now we can talk um, bully backs on inside zone and aiming points and all that sort of really intricate stuff. I would love to do that. And here's the reason why, like, please understand, it, it, it sounds like I'm smart-ish, but um, I, the more I learn about football, the more I, I know that I don't know anything about football. This is just so um, incredible and in-depth, and it's such a chess match that's ever-evolving. It's such a dynamic landscape that the more I have to dig back into the 101s and the 201s and the 301s and all that sort of stuff, the more I learn and the more I refresh. So um, I, if I get to do that, that means I just get to learn and grow a little bit more as a football coach and a football fan as well. So I would love to do that. we got to figure out the logistics of it, but um, I would be all about that. What a great question, Kyle. I love that. Marshall's here. Marshall's my dude. So a little bit of backstory before I read his comment. Marshall and I would watch film all the time. We've watched film for I don't know how many hours, probably 20 hours together already. Um, just him and I breaking down games and trying to scout opponents and all that sort of stuff. So Marshall's that dude. I appreciate you, Marshall. Marshall says, Coach just got here. You saying the Rams run a tight package? Was that referring to the Packers? I'm assuming you mean the Rams due to their tight ends having a little more depth. Yeah, the Rams run a lot of tight packages or condensed sets. And one of the reasons you like to do that is because of the hashes in the NFL game, okay? The hashes in, the, in NFL, so for those of you who may not know, and this is something I need to do a better job of pointing out, the hashes play such a huge role in the NFL game versus the college game or the high school game. Because right here, these hashes are only six yards apart, okay? From here to here, that's only six yards, okay? The rest of the field is wide open. The reason that's important is because the ball, no matter where it goes, if it goes out of bounds over here or whatever, okay, that ball gets spotted in between the hashes. So if this ball goes out of bounds, you start your next play right there on the left hash. Same thing over here, that ball goes out of bounds, you start that next play at the right hash, okay? If it comes out here and gets tackled or the ball's down there, you start that sucker right back in there. So any way you look at it formationally, it usually gives the offense an advantage, right? Because that means that they still have all this space out here. Even if they set their center here, they're still pretty even, right? They got all this space out here to work with and then really a lot of space out here in what we call the field, okay? So that's a huge advantage. In the college game, the hashes are a little bit wider, okay? So in the college game, let's say the hashes are here. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's 11 yards. I'm not certain, don't, don't quote me on that. Okay? But that means if that ball goes out of bounds and is now placed for the next play here, you've got a much smaller area in here than the pros do. And then it's even wider in high school. So we struggle with um, field boundary stuff a lot as an offensive unit in high school because those hashes are really wide. You got the hashes, then you got the numbers here, whatever. Okay, So if we go out of bounds over here, we've got a great big area of field to work with over here and very, very little field to work with over here. On top of that, in the high school game and sometimes in the college game, you don't have a whole lot of quarterbacks that can make that throw. You've got it in the pro game, right? But you don't got a ton of quarterbacks that can make that throw. That's a long way. That's got to be a frozen rope. It's got to be a fastball so that this dude doesn't just come and say thank you and go house call it, get his name in the paper and kiss all the pretty girls, okay? So that's just kind of one of those things that maybe you don't really think about, but yeah. Um, it definitely definitely changes the game for um, NFL. So with these tight hashes, to get back to Marshall's original question, what the Rams really like to do is run really condensed sets, meaning they like to have a lot of dudes really tight to the right tight to the offensive line. That means this dude has even more field to work with if he wants to go that way. Okay, it's just getting athletes the ball in space. Great question, Marshall. Uh, Matt Nagy back. I, I, Matt Nagy's the dude. He trolls pretty well. Um, I'm going to go back to some of these uh, comments here. Dan says that'd be awesome. Kyle says very cool. Appreciate it. Yeah, um, let's let's figure out that 101, 201, 301 video set. I'd be all about it. 
Um, Marshall says, that's what the run, Rams run, a little tight package. What are some things that the Packers might see when facing the Rams defense that you've seen? Um, we're going to do Rams defense tomorrow because <laughs> whew, um, it's nasty, nasty. So we'll get into some of that Rams defensive stuff tomorrow just because this could take a long time even just hitting up the offensive stuff. So uh, right back here tomorrow, 6 o'clock Central, we'll go through the Rams' entire defense and what the Packers can do to attack it. They do have some liabilities. They do have some things that they can do. But overall, this is a, a pretty nasty defense, and it's called very, very well. I don't know who the Rams' D coordinator is, but he's a very intelligent man. So um, we'll get into some of that uh, tomorrow. Good question, Marshall. Dan says, I know Petten likes six DBs for sure. Um, is it a smart way to go, being the other quarterback is not 100% and their strengths? Traditionally, um, six DBs would be a liability against this set. So let me get my chicken scratch out of the way here and show you why six DBs would be a bad thing traditionally against what the Rams like to do in some of these really condensed sets, okay? Here, we'll even have fun with it. And we'll go with a little bit more balanced look like this so we can show where the DBs would align, okay? Having six DBs, assuming you're gonna, take, you're gonna keep your three down linemen, means that's all you got for run stoppers. You got five dudes, because you got six DBs who are true DBs. Um, you got five dudes left, you can't play with 12. So usually how that would work is away from the condensed set is where you put your nickel. This is where that 39 kid would be, just looking to kill any of that cross action that comes across here, okay? Then you'd have a dime player out here. Then you'd have a corner, a corner, your strong safety, and your free safety. So you'd have one, two, three, four, five, six DBs. I'm not exactly sure what that gives you against this look unless it's a down and distance thing, third and seven or something like that, when you think they're definitely gonna run some play action or actually just drop back pass stuff. Um, six DBs is a great empty match. If you're seeing a lot of empty, you know, you can come out in this kind of dime package. But right now, if you're asking me who's better at taking on the block of a tight end in space and actually setting that edge, I don't know that it's a dime player, to be honest with you. I don't know that it's a dude a little lighter in his shorts. And as much as I love this dude's fight and attitude and toughness, eventually biology wins, right? So if he's get, if he has to set the edge here and he's got a tight end who's 6'5", 250, whatever, coming out to block him and he's a little lighter in his shorts, if it's me, I would like 55, 91, or 52, is it? Who, well, I don't remember what that Gary's kid's number is. But I like the bigger body dudes there who are actually trained day in and day out to shock and shed and set that edge. But that's just me. So that's a great question coming back to some of that dime stuff. Um, I just don't exactly know. Great, great question, though. Um, i got to catch up on some comments here. I'll be ready to go in just a, just a minute. Kyle says that'd be an amazing off-season video. Um, I agree that video series would be really fun to do in the off season. Here's the pinch of it though, a little bit. I'm gonna get really busy here personally coming up in about a month. It's actually like right after the Super Bowl. COVID killed our fall season for football, but Wisconsin was nice enough, enough to give us a spring season. So we're gonna have a spring season of five games for our seniors and, and you know everybody can come out and play and still be eligible and stuff. And then we're gonna roll right from that right into summer contact days, and then we're gonna go right into our fall season, assuming that COVID is over by then, or, or we're able to play or whatever. So it's gonna get a little busy, but I'm sure I can find you know a couple days in there, here and there. It might not actually be a bad thing to actually develop uh, for my players as well. So I'll be working on that, Kyle. Stay on the lookout for it. Marshall, Jair is known for being a lockdown corner. If he's gonna guard to the field, I'm just gonna assume he's got a harder job. What are some schemes that the Packers can run defensively to help him out? Um, what a great question. God, I love the way you ask questions, Marshall. Just your knowledge of the game is growing exponentially. So if he's a lockdown corner, and by lockdown we mean he is stuck in man coverage, right? So let's just give that old formation that we've been seeing time and time again, okay? A couple of tight end sets and a 12 personnel look. And let's just say that his job is to lock down this M receiver. A lot of times they put 17 out there, okay? Robert Woods, they like him to be that off receiver. We call it M, a lot of teams call it X or Z. It doesn't matter what name you give it. He's just that dude, right? So if Jair's gonna lock him down, the first thing that I would do is try him in an inside leverage, okay? Take away literally every inside breaking route. So if this dude wants to try to run this little drag or a quick slant 
or a little hitch or a post or whatever, okay, if he wants to take away, if he wants to run any of those inside braking routes, if you can take those away with your corner, you've really locked him down to two routes that dude can run, okay? So if you have inside leverage, which means you line up, when this dude lines up, you line up inside of him, you're starting to take away what routes he can do just based on your alignment, just because he now has to go through you to get to that route, okay? The downside of it is because he's on the outside, you're always in a trail technique if he runs an out. Outs will always beat man coverage, almost always, unless they're like floated and you can run and undercut them. But a well-thrown out, thrown to the sideline, should always beat man coverage. So one of the things I've seen the Packers doing lately that I freaking love is go ahead and put him head up. Because he's so dominant, align him nose to nose with that receiver. Usually when this tap breaks in, Jair is right on the top of it. What they can do then, if he cuts in and Jair is on the top of it, is they can funnel him right to a safety. So it's still kind of man coverage, but it's man coverage with safety help. So if that ball gets thrown on a quick slant and, J and Jair is on the backside of it, who's stopping that safety from jumping that route? That safety can go ahead and get really aggressive knowing that he's got Jair on the backside. And this is one of the things I wish I would have made the video when, when Jair got snubbed for the All-Pro team because this is the stuff that never shows up in a stat book, right? His willingness to go head up or even outside leverage and take down all of those lockdown stats, if you will, because he's so very willing to do the team stuff, okay? He's willing to play outside leverage, funnel that sucker in, let Savage, let Amos go get those picks, Okay? Let the dime player who might be playing in that window go get those picks and those pass breakups and those numbers. This cat cares about one thing, and that's winning a Super Bowl. And I'm willing to bet if you were to ask a guy like Jair Alexander what's more important to you, being all pro or having 16 carats on your right hand, my guess is he's picking the Super Bowl. So uh, I, I got a little sidetracked there, but those are some of the things the Packers can do. Um, my apologies. I'm falling way behind on the comments now, guys. My, my bad. Um... Mary says, got another question back above. If you can scroll up, Coach, absolutely, Mary. My apologies. I don't mean to get this far behind on these. Um, Mary says, from checking out Rams film for this, did you see any type of deep play shots, like 35-plus, that they try to pull off of, off of the play action that we need to worry about, like the pack do with MVS? Absolutely. What a question. And they do it. <laughs> what a great segue. They like to do it to this kid, 17, and this kid, 10. Anything that they try to run, they try to run through this guy, okay? He's kind of that deep shot, that MVS, that take the top off. He's their everything player. So they're going to do everything they can to get the ball to number 10. One of the things they really like, and it's just because Goff has the arm to do it, I don't recommend you recommending this to your local high school coach because he's going to laugh at you and then probably kick you, okay? But one of the things they do off of this really hard play action, say they got play action going this way, so the whole line's blocking this way, okay? And you boot and you go here. Usually what play action does, one of the downfalls of play action, is it kind of cuts the field in half, so to speak. Or, as this quarterback is booting way out here, and he's booting all the way around, usually you have to have all these routes coming back to him, because you never, as everybody says, you never want to throw the ball against your body down the field. So dude's running all the way out here. One of the things I've seen that was absolutely magic from them, though, just because Goff has the arm to do it, is they'll start dragging Cooper across, giving it the old, you know, over-under look on a flood route or something like that off of play action, and then they'll snap him off here and drive him top hot, okay? So they'll go here and then just bend that sucker up. And usually what that does, all this action gets these safeties rolling to cover their pattern match. And with that corner out here, usually he's going to try to leak under this route and take it away. So if you put your foot in the ground and go north, go vertical, that sucker's wide open. And they've hit that a time or two, so you got, you got to be careful of that. you got to make sure this kid is aware of that, okay? And that's where, again, these guys can come in and help, those two inside backers. Thank you, Mary. What a great question. My bad. Um, I didn't mean to miss that question. I just, there's a lot going on, and I'm not good at multitasking. Just ask my wife. Next question, Marshall, cover three schemes you mentioned. Yeah, that's one of them. I'm kind of going back here. I'm kind of flopping all over the place, but going back, yeah, cover three um, can certainly help against a lot of this play action or pattern match cover three is what I'd be running. Um, still staying in a too high shell, 
but then dropping out of it at the snap, post-snap, so that it's a little bit different look for the quarterback. Um, so, the, the oh, you're talking about the Jair look here. My apologies. When I did that Jair stuff, um, that's what we call a divorced or a blended coverage. Um, and that, that's more of like a man-free type of coverage. So for those of you who may be unaware of it, let's just put a couple of receivers here, like they're in a spread formation, okay? So a man-free type of look means that underneath all of these dudes are covered man-to-man. -man. So red means man-to-man. -man. Wherever these receivers go, there's a man on them. What man-free means, and you can do this a couple of different ways, it's just a little more expensive. So we'll go through it like this. Cover zero, cover one, and cover two, man. Anytime you tag man on the end of these coverages, it just means it's man underneath, and then this tells the safeties what to do. Cover one, cover two, cover zero. If it's cover zero, that's straight up man, baby. That means you now have seven defenders that you can bring after the quarterback if you want. Six if you keep a, a linebacker in to account for the tailback, okay? But cover zero is straight man across the board. you got no help over the top. What cover one is, or cover one man, means you're still locked up here. You've just got a safety here who's taking away anything that might hit this way, okay? So if they beat you here, he can go help that or that. So it's just kind of a safety valve, if you will, to have cover one. And then cover two obviously takes away a little bit of what you can do with a pass rush because now you have to have two safeties up here, but then they're playing deep half. So if we split the field in half, this hawk safety is going to help out anybody who comes in here and beats that man coverage. The free is going to do the same thing over here, okay? That's cover two or two man or two man under. There's a billion different names for it. So what I was mentioning, Marshall, with Jair is, is he's here. You can get some of this look, okay? Force that in and let him jump the route because Jair is going to be over the top. So that's a two man type of look. You can run it under one man just depending on the formation, making sure those receivers don't get split out too wide. Um, Kyle says, what are some similarities on defense we can do that work against the Titans that might work against the Rams? Yo, this Titans game plan was dope, but um, a little bit different look from the Titans. They weren't afraid to spread it out a little bit more. I mean, they, they had some really nice um, play action stuff with Tannehill, but they also weren't afraid to get into 10 personnel, no tight ends on the field, and make it look like they were going to throw and just run inside zone with Derrick Henry. So obviously... You know how that went. Um, your inside backers did a great job of, of sucking that up, and then you started to see your D-line progress a little bit more and that sort of stuff. One of the things that the Packers did, though, was stayed in a lot of what we call an under front. So remember I showed everything here in this type of alignment, right, with a nose, a four-eye, a four-eye, a backer, and a backer, right? What they did was play a lot of under front against Tennessee, and that really screwed up their zone rules. So the offensive line has to have specific sets of rules so that they know what to do against any defense they may face. Okay, so if we're running wide zone to our right here, what they did, excuse me, was go into an under front, which put the nose backside. This four eye technique now became either a head up tackle in a two tech right here, or even sometimes shaded just a little bit out into a three tech. And then they put the other tackle here. What that allowed them to do is play up really tight with that backer and then shift the inside linebackers over like this. And then they could play off with that dude. Okay, now he doesn't have to be so high up on the edge because you've got a five tech here. Okay, so it looks a little bit more like a forefront where this dude can be in a two point or a three point stance. It doesn't really matter. But now this backer can go ahead and read those two gaps. This backer can go ahead and read that gap to that gap. And it allows the backers to steal gaps. Okay? Or it just kind of allows them to be responsible for two, knowing that eventually they're going to pick one. And that allows him, if you need him to, to go cover the flats or what they did against the Bears that was so freaking dirty. I loved it. Was they played an under front and they baited play action to happen. They wanted to see play action. So if we're seeing play action to the right where Trubisky is coming out from under center here, and he's coming back around this way. With this dude freed up, 
because they're playing that under front and stealing gaps of that those inside backers, that means they've got nobody left to block that dude if these three go out on their route patterns, right? Who's blocking that dude? And that's the sack you saw in the first half. So really, really coy, very intelligent defensive adjustments. Um, Marshall says 52 is Rashawn Gary. Thank you, dude. Um, I just I suck at personnel. My apologies. Goose says the Packers run a five-man front, three outside backers, three down linemen. Um, yeah, they certainly can. I mean, they mix up their fronts all the time. They do a really nice job of that, of screwing up some of those zone rules. So don't be surprised to see a lot of this, the under front, or the, the, the four-man front out of a base 3-4 personnel. Don't be surprised to see a lot of that, um, especially when you're setting well, – this would actually – my bad. I'm an idiot. This would actually be an over front because you're bumping to the strength. I went play side instead of strength side. But over under fronts can definitely do some of that stuff and then make that outside backer walk off the line. Good question. Uh, Marshall says, yeah, I have a safety to help or at least shade, discourage those over the top inside throws. Definitely that's what uh, cover one and cover three are designed for. Or excuse me, cover one and cover two man are designed for. Travis says, who would you take to be your franchise DB, Ramsey or Alexander? Ah. Uh, uh, you put me in a tough spot here, Travis, because to be honest with you, I haven't studied a ton of film on Ramsey. Um, I've studied a lot of Alexander's just because of all my work with Packernet and stuff like that um, with Ryan and with JJ. But I haven't done a ton of film study on, on Ramsey, so I'm going to back out of that question, dude. I'm going to bail. Uh, my bad. I know that's not what you wanted to hear, but I know Ja is very very good. So um, maybe I'll be able to answer that a little bit more uh, tomorrow when we get into the Rams defense because I'll, I'll be able to study Ramsey just a little bit more. Mary again says, that's fine. Thanks for the answer. I know Petten never likes to give up the big play, so I was curious if they give us much to worry about on their end. Um, they do. I mean, they, they can give up the big play if you have to be really aggressive to stop the run. Um, I think that's why sometimes Packer fans get Frustrated, I guess, with Petten because he is willing to concede those four, five, six-yard plays at times um, just to see if your offense can continue to march down the field without making a mistake. It's not a turnover-driven uh, defense, but it is one that's very opportunistic and can make those plays at the right times just with some very intelligent um, play calling. So good question. Um, Atheist for the Cause says, can you help me understand why we play 10 yards off in third and four? Are they just giving up the first, trying to get more advantageous scenario? Um, yes and no. And this is such a great question. This sucker is so loaded. So let's go to a spread set to answer this so I can explain some of the coverage rules that they have or some that people have played, okay? Or some that the Packers have played. My apologies. So let's just say we're in a spread set here, a nice even two by two set. And let's just say it is third and four, okay? Down in distance says third and four. You're going to have a corner way off that frustrates you, right? Maybe he's outside a line at 10 yards, okay? And then you're going to have your hawk, your free, and your other corner. And usually, if one corner is off, the other corner is up or tight. Because what the Packers really like to do is kind of spin their coverage, okay? If you've got an outside backer here and an outside backer here, just imagine the down lineman and the inside backers there. What the Packers really try to do is confuse people by spinning their coverage. And they do this really well, but obviously, if you can diagnose it, you can pick it apart. So they'll start aligned like this, and then they'll spin from what looks like a cover four or quarters look or something like that. They're trying to bait you to throw into a quarters look. And they'll spin this corner up and have him take the flats. Then they'll spin this safety late to take that deep third, this safety to take this deep third, and leave this corner here to take that deep half. The reason he's playing off is because he's supposed to play deep. And then the thought is, you can take that outside backer, especially if you're in some of these under fronts where he doesn't have a ton of run responsibility except late run, okay? That allows him to go ahead and get to the flats a little bit faster. So the corner playing off 10 yards, if that's a quick hitch, yeah, that backer isn't going to get there in time. So they're going to run and try to have to cage this and make that play at four to six, seven yards, whatever, give up the first down. I get it. But what they're really trying to go for here is using this dude now to rock. So it's a 50-50 shot, right? It's high risk, high reward. Well, not really high risk. You give up a first down, but it's a high reward type of shot. So this usually is that kid, 39, right? So if you're going to spin to the flats here and he's covered over the top, that means this dude is free to do what we call rob, where he can watch the release here. And if he gets anything in breaking or 
outbreaking, he knows he can get under that. We saw this in the Bears game, okay? Where Jair had Jimmy Graham here, and Jimmy Graham ran that high seam, okay? Jair didn't buy that at all. Jair didn't run with it. It was fourth and one or something like that, fourth and short. And what they were trying to do here is get Jimmy Graham to run that seam, to pull Jair off of it, and then hit the flat right underneath it on an out route against this guy who's inside a line, right? It only makes sense. But as Jimmy Graham's running that off, Jair comes crashing down on this, and Chandon Sullivan here, knowing that Jair is coming down on it, now has the freedom to undercut that route. And he was able to knock it away. It should have been picked, but I'm sure you guys remember the play. That's how it all happened. So for as many times as you see this and you get all frustrated about why are we playing 10 yards off on third and four, you're kind of trying to bait this stuff to happen. Okay? Sometimes it obviously works out for you. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes a quarterback is smart enough here. He can be like, wow, they drip, so we're going to go ahead and fire this out before the outside backer can get there. Sometimes, honestly, in the NFL, quarterbacks just get lucky. He just guesses. He thinks, hey, I'm going to try to throw it that way. If he throws it that way, it's either picked or it's knocked down or something. If he throws it this way, he's going to get a completion for a first down. So it's an excellent question. I totally get it. Um, but I also see the thought process behind it. It's kind of a medium risk, high reward type of play. Love this. Um, Kyle's the man. Holy smokes. You guys are just blowing me up. Hang on now. Um, Marshall says... Nope. I'm down from that a little bit. Um, great question, Atheist, man. That is a <laughs> that is a good, good, good question. Um, Kyle says, thank you. No, you're busy. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Kyle. I mean, I, I really appreciate you guys just hanging out and asking some questions, man. Um, Marshall says, would, would a more exotic blitz be effective? Assuming we trust Jair, Amos, Savage in coverage, I would say Chandon Sullivan if it's underneath. Um, would blitzing a corner nickel dime be effective even against a tight package? The problem with this is the way that the Rams love to run. Now, they, they will run some spread stuff. They definitely have this in their playbook. I mean, every pro team has to. But the way that they want to run, remember, it's super protected up front by play action. Okay? So, taking a look at the way that they like to run with that dual tight end set or even a wing. Okay? We'll keep the other receivers off the field. When they run this play action stuff... Remember, all the gaps to this side are covered, okay? And if he's releasing out for a route, all these gaps are covered. So sure, you can bring a dime from this side or whoever it is, but he's going to run into dudes a lot bigger than him, okay? So that's why you start to see some of those under fronts or over fronts or some of this type of look here where you can try to maybe get this dude off the line a little bit more. And this is the Bears play, right? So now I'm understanding these dudes either have to go out on, rock, on route or have to max protect. This guy now can come in. So you're kind of guessing, well, when is he going to actually play action and trying to get that guy off the line so he can come in and not get lost in the wash. Um, exotic blitzes don't always work against 12 personnel, 13 personnel, these heavy sets. They don't work very well anyways on um, play action sets. But some of these backside blitzes do, because worst case scenario, dude, if it's not play action and they do run the ball this way, well, he's not wasted, right? He doesn't have a gap to cover, so he can go try to run that down from the backside if he wants to. Okay, that's pretty easy. The only spot it can get you in a little bit of trouble in is if they run the ball at that dude, because then he's got to try to beat that block in space. And that's sometimes easy, sometimes not. Great question, though. Love it. Avia says, okay, thanks. That's why our defense gets so much worse when Green gets hurt because he has the speed to get to the receiver. For sure. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna play in some dime sets and you're gonna have that outside backer run into the flat, outside backer being a nickel or a dime, um, that dude better have some speed and he better be a pretty sure tackler. Yeah, great, great point there. Um, Dan says, seems Petten is willing to give up the first down. His plan is to make him execute 10 plus plays, no more plays. Chances of them making the mistake is higher. That's exactly it, dude. You nailed it. Um, Atheist says, that makes sense. Thanks. Dude, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, time kind of got away from me here. I kind of wanted to go an hour just to kind of give you a breakdown of the offense and what the Packers can do defensively. It's now 7.13 my time. Um, my sweet little girl goes to bed at 7.30, so I want to maybe try to run home, give her a kiss, see if she'll read me a bedtime story before she falls asleep. But please, please, please tune in tomorrow night if you can, if you're not busy. We're going to go through this Rams defense, and the super exciting thing is we're going to run through the Packers offense. And that, 
freaking mind blowing, you guys. You you can't even imagine. Like I I I, I know maybe 40% of it is so so dynamic and in depth. So um and it's a Friday night, so my daughter gets to stay up later, so I won't be in as big of a time crunch. Um, if you can't, I'd love to see you hang, even pop in and out a little bit on Saturday during the game. We're going to be doing this kind of stuff, but with live plays, I'll have the game up over here on my screen. I'll be YouTube live here. I'll be on the comments. So I, I just really hope to keep interacting with you in some sort of football setting. Again, I can't thank you enough for doing this. It's just an absolute blast to an old football coach who's just missing football like crazy right now. So I sincerely appreciate it. Follow Pack Daddy, follow JJ Leahy, subscribe to the Pack Daddy NFL channel. If you feel like giving, give your money to Pack Daddy because he's the one who sets all of this up and makes it happen. Thank you again so much. Have a great night.